Hello and welcome to Dialogue. I'm Yang Ray in Beijing. The situation in the South China Sea took a worrying turn for the worse after the U.S. guided missile destroy. U.S.'s William P. Lawrence conducted another so-called freedom of navigation operation near Yongshu Reef in China's Nanshan Islands in early May. How should we view the two countries' concerns from a historical perspective? How will the recent tensions in the South China Sea impact on long-term China-U.S. relations? And how should China and the U.S. work together instead of increasing the conflict between the rising and the new established power? To discuss these issues and more, I'm very happy to be joined in the studio by Professor Neil Ferguson, a professor of history at Harvard University. But before we get started, let's look at this. The South China Sea dispute has become one of the biggest concerns to Sino-U.S. relations. China's foreign ministry once again expressed concern after a U.S. Navy warship, USS William P. Lawrence, carried out a navigational operation near a disputed reef in the South China Sea on May the 10th. China took measures to monitor, track, and war in accordance with the law. I have to point out, this action by the U.S. side threatened China's sovereignty and security interests endangered the staff and facilities on the reef, and damaged regional peace and stability. As we have reiterated many times, China resolutely opposes such actions by the U.S. side, and we will keep taking necessary measures to safeguard China's sovereignty and security. This operation marks the third time in less than a year that the U.S. has conducted so-called freedom of navigation operations in the South China Sea. The Department of Defense conducted a freedom of navigation operation in the South China Sea, specifically in the region of Fiery Cross Reef in the Spratly Islands, to uphold the rights and freedoms of all states under international law and to challenge excessive maritime claims of some claimants in the South China Sea. Since Chinese President Xi Jinping's state visit to the U.S. last September, the views of the two nations have differed increasingly over militarization in the South China Sea. But there was also cooperation on display when Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi visited U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry in Washington in February. The two countries celebrated common ground on addressing climate change, and both diplomats worked together on a resolution for the United Nations Security Council to toughen sanctions against the DPRK's nuclear test and rocket launch. Observers from both countries believe the South China Sea dispute should not be an obstacle to China-U.S. relations, since the two sides are enjoying more and more common economic interests and cooperation in multiple fields. More dialogue and communication are needed in building new consensus, they say, to benefit both China and the U.S., as well as other nations in the world. Welcome to Dialogue, sir. It's a pleasure to be here. The spokesperson of the Chinese Foreign Ministry accused the U.S. of flexing military muscles in the name of uh, protecting freedom of navigation. But the U.S. says uh, instead, well, their navy has patrolling this uh, South China Sea for 160 years. But whose history of a presence is longer there in the South China Sea from the perspective of historian? I should also say from the perspective of a British historian, uh, because I, I don't sit here as a spokesman for the United States. Uh, you know, this is a very complicated question, and I think your viewers have a right to hear some of the complexity before we get into the history. On the one side, China says these Spratly Islands, the Paracels, are her islands, and she's entitled to build more islands if she wants, and then to treat the waters around those islands as her territorial waters. Uh, and the United States says, well, we don't have any territorial claim, we're just going to enforce the international law of the sea and free navigation for any ships that are sailing there for innocent purposes. So roughly speaking, those are the, those are the dividing lines. But what makes it, I think, doubly complicated is the interest of a whole bunch of other players in this uh, story. The Philippines, uh, Vietnam, to name just two of the countries that also have uh, interests in and claims in the South China Sea. And I think it might be better to think of this as a multiplayer game rather than a two-player game and to see the United States as acting on behalf not just of itself but of, of these other nations. That's really how I tend to think of it. China insists uh, that uh, we conduct uh, a dual-track dialogue with uh, other claimants in the South China Sea. Uh, it means 
We hold a one-on-one -on -one dialogue with uh, an individual claimant. On the other hand, we talk to ASEAN, the regional bloc, uh, in which the claimants uh, seek their asylum politically for support. Now, what do you think of China's proposal? Well, my attitude is that diplomacy is, is preferable to any kind of uh, military conflict, any kind of naval conflict, and it's extremely encouraging that uh, the different interested parties are in dialogue with one another. I don't think, however, that it's realistic to expect this to be resolved in a series of bilateral negotiations. Too many players are involved in this, uh, and it seems to me that the United States uh, is really trying to play a role uh, of uh, arbiter rather than interested party and trying to make sure that these different uh, uh, regional conflicts don't escalate and that, that seems to me to be highly desirable. In the end, uh, we can't pretend that the Philippines and China are equal partners. They're, they're not. China is a vastly more powerful state uh, than the Philippines. Uh, the same goes for Vietnam or any other of the regional players. They're all dwarfed by China. The role of the United States, I think, in this context is to offer some kind of balance and to continue to exert the kind of role that it has played in the Asia-Pacific region since the 1930s and 1940s, when, after all, it played an absolutely decisive role in defeating the ambitions of Imperial Japan. Here is the question of how to look at the international law of the sea. The role of the United States is uh, very questionable for the very fact that it is not a party to unclose. The China will definitely reject whatever result and outcome of the international arbitration in The Hague. Hence, um, disputes uh, will further flare up uh, between and among the claimants, China being one of them. Therefore, what do you think of China's uh, challenge to the U.S. leadership? Because, as I said, the United States is not a party to unclose. Well, both the United States and China are acting as great powers have acted uh, throughout history with a certain uh, disregard uh, for international conventions. Uh, the United States, as you rightly say, is, has not ratified the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. China, meanwhile, uh, insists on territorial claims uh, that are contested by other countries. And so in some ways, uh, China and the United States are, are behaving in rather similar ways. And this tells us an important historical lesson. Whatever the international law, and, and the international law will always be open to dispute because territorial and maritime claims are, are, are very difficult to determine. They, they're in many ways lost in the mists of time, these claims. Uh, but in the world of great power politics, we need to be careful uh, because we've seen in the past when an established power is suddenly challenged by a rising power, the danger is that it escalates into conflict. Uh, and that has happened more often than not, every time this situation has arisen in world history. We would be, I think, making a grave mistake in Washington and in Beijing if we allowed the tiny little islands uh, in the South China Sea to become the flashpoint for a great power conflict. We'd be making exactly the same mistake that Germany uh, and Britain made a hundred years ago when Germany was the rising power, Britain was the established power, and disputes over relatively small countries, Bosnia, Belgium, ended up producing World War I. We have to learn from that, that history. Well, who is the stronger side in the maritime dispute? Look at the five military bases that the U.S. enjoys access to. Look at the 1951 Mutual Defense Treaty between Washington and Manila. And look at the proactive efforts of the Abe administration to align itself with all the other claimants against China. These are the legacy of the Cold War from the Chinese perspective. And China says, well, you declare you won't take side on the issue of sovereignty, and yet the United States is on a far superior uh, position, is in a far superior position militarily. So what should China do to uh, avoid having head-on collision? Because President Xi Jinping said uh, he was seeking a new type of major country relationship, the essence of which means no conflict and no, no confrontation. Uh, instead, we should have uh, co-prosperity. 
I think everybody is in favour of, uh, of co-prosperity. Who could be against that? And everybody, I think, would be in favour of what Dr. Henry Kissinger has called co-evolution between China and the United States. But let's think about it uh, in both military and economic terms. In military and naval terms, the United States is still the superpower. It is significantly ahead uh, of all other nations in terms of military technology and military capability. And that will continue to be true, certainly, at sea for some years to come. Uh, on the other hand, when it comes to the economics of the Asia-Pacific region, uh, China is increasingly the principal trading partner of all Asian nations. And this gives it a certain amount of economic leverage that the United States can't easily match. So in that sense, I think the two powers are in some kind of a balance with one another. Uh, President Xi is right to talk about co-prosperity. Five trillion dollars worth of trade pass through mm -hmm. the South China Sea, and most of it is trade from or to uh, China. The question is whether China is going to contribute to co-prosperity by building surface-to-air missiles on artificial islands in the South China Sea, or whether it can better contribute to co-prosperity by seeking some kind of peaceful resolution of these complex territorial it's because maritime disputes. Other claimants have installed their military facilities in the nearby islands, such as Vietnam, which also did land reclaiming. Uh, well, having said this. Let's look at the, this book. You are the author of Kissinger, who helped open the door between U.S. and China uh, in the early 1970s. And he said in his book on China that a large degree of Chinese strategic thinking is aimed at preventing encirclement by foreign powers, as, what, as was witnessed by the Chinese intervention to save North Korea during the Korean War in the early 1950s. Do you agree? And do you view China's strategy in the South China Sea also reflects this feature? Dr. Kissinger's book on China is a great work and it makes the point that we should learn from the experience of Europe in 1914. The Germans also argued that they were being encircled, but one of the lessons of European history is that sometimes you can uh, create a self-fulfilling prophecy. Uh, as Germany became more assertive, so its neighbors became more concerned and gradually it ended up creating an alliance against it uh, in the form of the British, French and Russian combination that fought Germany in World War I. So sometimes the fear of encirclement can actually lead to the encirclement. That, I think, is a point that Dr. Kissinger has made. So China has to be extremely careful not to make the mistakes that Germany made over a hundred years ago uh, by finding itself, through its own assertiveness, creating a coalition, an alliance against it. I think China's leaders, of course, are great students of history and are not likely to make these same mistakes. Still, you begin to see the danger in the current situation uh, in which, as you said, uh, different Asian powers are asserting their territorial rights, creating uh, military emplacements in the South China Sea. This is a dangerous situation from the point of view of the United States. The US has no interest in militarizing the South China Sea. It has no interest in an arms race in Asia. Uh, the question is, how should the United States cope with the fact of China's rise? Should it simply accept that China is going to be the dominant power in the, Asia, uh, in the Asian region? Uh, or should it try, in some measure, to balance China's rise? And of course, China's smaller neighbors want the United States to play that balancing Excuse me, role. Neil, majority of the Chinese uh, lawmakers uh, and scholars would question the legitimacy of your argument that the United States does not seek to militarize the South China Sea. Look at the formidable military presence, or what we call the forward military presence in Northeast Asia, and look at the five military bases in the Philippines that the U.S. resumed. Look at the alliance, the legacy of the Cold War. Who is militarizing this region? China cites many um, uh, international documents and history books to illustrate its possession of the islands uh, from a long time ago. Who has a longer history here? Let's think about not just the last 200 years. Uh, let, let's think even further back. Uh, it's been roughly half a millennium since the early 16th century, uh, since Westerners began to interact regularly through trade uh, with China. And in the 500 years of interaction between the West and China, the pendulum has swung from periods of conflict 
to periods of harmony. Uh, that's one of the themes of the lecture course that I'm teaching to Chinese students at Tsinghua uh, right now. Uh, and my point is that we have to be careful to make sure that the pendulum doesn't swing from harmony uh, to conflict. We've been through a period of great harmony since the 1970s. Uh, since Dr. Kissinger came here in 1971 and Richard Nixon in 1972, China and the United States have benefited from an explosion in trade, in investment, uh, and in interactions, cultural interactions like the one that we're having right now. It's been an enormously happy time. I, I used the word chimerica to describe mm -hmm. what had happened, a kind of fusion between China and America. It's pretty amazing when you think that in the early 1950s, these countries were at war in the K Korean uh, peninsula. So we've achieved a, a terrific harmony. And problems, much more severe problems than the Spratly Islands, have been overcome uh, in a diplomatic dialogue. Think of the Taiwan issue that was so problematic when Dr. Kissinger first came uh, to this country. So I think we can learn from the experience of the 1970s uh, that territorial disputes, arguments about history are all very well, but the key priority needs to be to maintain a harmonious relationship between the United States and China. And that also involves making sure that China's neighbors are in a harmonious relationship with both China and the United States, the two superpowers of the region. It's a very impressive theory on pendulum. You are watching dialogue with uh, uh, Professor Neil Ferguson, a historian from Harvard University. We are talking about the maritime disputes in the South China Sea and the very important relationship between Washington and Beijing in the 21st century. We'll be back in a short while. Please stay with us. Welcome back. Look at why the United States invaded Vietnam. It was afraid of having the domino reactions ideologically. But today, China says it's very dangerous to examine the new reality and evolution in China through an ideological lens. Uh, with the Cold War coming to an end in 1991, the disintegration of the former Soviet, in, Soviet Union is, of course, a game changer for the West. Is that a strong reason for the U.S. to sit back complacently and says, I'll be the world leader for yet another 100 years? without uh, looking at the fact that China is fast catching up economically. Look at China's increasing presence in Latin America and in, in, in other uh, parts of the world. We do not seek to challenge the American leadership. But look at the uh, military-industrial complex, which seeks to antagonize a country to, to have good reasons for their military budget. Now, who is militarizing the world? This, is a, this has been a strong argument by many Chinese who say we have been misunderstood. Well, I think uh, very few Americans uh, complacently assume that the United States will be dominant uh, for the rest of the 21st century. On the contrary, opinion polls show that under the Obama administration, Americans have become less and less confident about their country's uh, future dominance. Uh, so that's the, the first point. The in, second in, point in, in just, other words, just less and less confidence, does that mean a reflection of fears and therefore the rise of Donald Trump? I'm, I'm not sure that it's all about fear. We'll fears come, and we'll, anger. We'll come to Donald Trump in a minute, mm -hmm. but before we get to Donald Trump, uh, let's remember that the U.S. defense budget has actually been shrinking uh, under the Obama administration as a result of the fiscal pressures that the United States is under. And even that shrinking budget is increasingly consumed by pensions to veterans. So the United States is clearly not uh, in the process of, of militarizing. If anything, its military capabilities are dwindling to the great concern of uh, some observers in Washington. Uh, so I don't think it's fear that we should think in terms of here. I think the United States has been through an extremely difficult time economically, and that has been the uppermost concern in people's minds, far more than foreign policy. The pivot uh, to Asia that was supposed to happen uh, has of course been almost impossible to execute because the problems of the Middle East which have become the dominant preoccupation of American foreign policy for more than a decade simply refused to go away. The Obama administration thought that it could get out of the Middle East, get out of Iraq, leave the Arab Spring uh, to happen and focus uh, on Asia, but it's proved impossible. And right now what we're seeing is an escalation of American involvement in Syria, in Iraq, 
in Libya. So the pivot is something that it's turned out to be impossible to execute. Many Americans are very frustrated by this. They do not want to be involved in the complexities of sectarian conflict in the Middle East, but they are finding it impossible to walk away from that region. And that seems to me why the Chinese should not worry too much about uh, an American pivot to Asia. It's simply impossible for the United States to execute, but, even if it were a good idea. But it's ridiculous to always take the United States as a monolithic whole or a single voice. So, Obama, the Obama administration, is accused by many overseas observers of uh, exercising pretty weak leadership over the Pentagon. And the Pentagon always uh, cries foul about the alleged China threat. Harry Harris, uh, the commander in chief of the Pacific Fleet, says China, uh, the United States uh, want to fight a war overnight. That's part of the tradition to exaggerate the threat that the U.S. Navy faces in the West Pacific. Well, in my experience, all, all naval commanders uh, are trained to plan for war. It's really the reason that they have these expensive ships. And we should never listen in the United States to what uh, admirals and generals say. We should listen to what the President of the United States says. Now, we know what the President thinks because he gave extensive interviews to Jeffrey Goldberg of the Atlantic Monthly that were published just a, a few weeks ago. And these were highly significant because I think they showed the extent to which President Obama is impatient with America's traditional allies, and yes, mindful of uh, the rise of China, uh, aggressive in some of his language. Uh, interestingly, uh, he raised the possibility in that interview of a U.S. naval base in Vietnam, which certainly uh, uh, struck me as remarkable considering uh, America's history with Vietnam. So I, I think the president is, is going through a reassessment of America's America's strategic priorities. The key problem is, though, he's about to leave the White House, and in January of next year, he will be gone. And the big question uh, for those who observe the uh, US-China relationship is, is obviously who is going to be there in his place. Will it be Hillary Clinton, or will it be Donald Trump? If it's Donald Trump, we are in for an extremely uncertain and bumpy ride, because as you know, Donald Trump has repeatedly attacked China in his election campaign, mostly on trade, has threatened a trade war with China, but also in his recent foreign policy speech, uh, Mr. Trump attacked President Obama for being weak on the issue of the South China Sea. Now, that raises the possibility of a president who is altogether more confrontational uh, with China than any we have seen since the 1950s. Prime Minister Shinzo Abe paid a visit to Europe the year before last, uh, comparing the current uh, geopolitical tensions between Tokyo and Beijing to the rivalry between the UK and Germany before the First World War. On the other hand, many policymakers say the growing economic interdependence would prevent major economies from going to war. But he said no, he, dismissively. Prime Minister Shinzo Abe said no, dismissively. And he gave a strong impression and delivered a powerful message to Europeans that he's ready to go to war. That's why he's seriously considering rewriting the pacifist constitution to give more powers to the self-defense forces, quote unquote, and therefore by aligning itself with all the competitors, particularly the United States, they're going to fight a war. Well, I looked very carefully at what uh, uh, Prime Minister Shinzo Abe said at the Davos World Economic Forum in 2014, and uh, I didn't take him to imply an intention uh, to go to war. Rather, I think he was warning that we should learn the lesson of 1914. And that lesson uh, was, and I think in this he's quite correct, that even although Germany and Britain were very economically interdependent, they still ended up going to war over the seemingly trivial issue of Bosnia uh, and, the, uh, and the question of Belgian neutrality. So I think that warning from history was a perfectly reasonable thing uh, to say, and it's a point that I myself have made. The good news is that since then, my feeling is, uh, and my observation suggests, that relations between China and Japan have somewhat improved. And we hear much less about the disputes in the East China Sea that uh, were such a preoccupation of a couple of years 
ago. Uh, I think that, uh, that the likelihood is uh, that, that both China and Japan will avoid conflict because I can't see how either side would benefit from it. The stakes are extremely high for China. Well, that depends on China's growth being maintained. Uh, and right now I get the picture that uh, Chinese policymakers have quite a struggle on their hands to make sure that China's growth can be maintained even at a rate of 6.5%. As long as China's leaders' number one priority uh, is economic growth, they will not really be able to risk conflict of the sort that would entirely disrupt their highly open uh, globalized economy. So my sense is that the world has only one real war to worry about, and that is a war in the Middle East, a war between Sunni powers, Saudi Arabia, etc., and Shiite powers, particularly Iran. That war is brewing. The region is already extremely violent. The danger is that conflict will escalate. And you know, China will be more affected by a massive war in the Middle East than the United States because China relies much more on the Middle East for its oil. That's the war to worry about. I think what we see in East Asia, whether it's in the South China Sea or whether it's the Dayu Senkaku Islands dispute, these things are just saber rattling, as we used to say, uh, not serious uh, danger of war. Uh, and, and that seems to me like the really important point we should conclude on. There are all sorts of disputes in Asia, and there will continue to be frictions between China and its neighbors. That is what you would expect as a country rises as fast as China has. Uh, the most important thing is that the United States, which acted so decisively uh, to prevent Imperial Japan dominating Asia in the 1940s, continues to play the role that it's played since the 1970s as a peacemaker. Uh, and a friend of China in the Asia-Pacific region. And that is what I would hope to see the next president do, whether it's Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump. What do you think uh, should be the most important thing or measures to be rolled out in managing the crisis, either in the South China Sea or in the Middle East, where we see the origin of uh, this current asylum-seeking crisis that threatens to destroy the Schengen Agreement, the foundation for the regional integration in Europe? Well, let me say that I think the second problem is probably a good deal bigger than the first, uh, insofar as there will be a massive migration crisis uh, in Europe and indeed more generally uh, in the Mediterranean region as long as the Middle East is on fire. And right now nobody has an answer to the question, how do we bring peace to the Middle East? In fact, there's every sign that next year will be even more violent than this year and the year after that will be still worse. So that's a much bigger problem because there is an active war going on uh, in Syria and to a degree also in Iraq uh, and that war is creating opportunities for some of the most dangerous people in the world, the jihadist fighters of Islamic State, to extend their influence right across North Africa into Sub-Saharan Africa and even increasingly into South Asia. So that's the world's number one geopolitical problem. Uh, the problems that we see in the South China Sea are really trivial by comparison. Uh, and it ought to be relatively easy uh, for the uh, US president and uh, uh, the Chinese president to sit down and say, look, let's not engage uh, in shadow boxing. Let's not risk uh, some kind of incident that escalates the situation. Uh, let's make sure that we come to an understanding about what is acceptable to both sides. Now, there doesn't need to be complete agreement. The US and China did not completely agree on a whole range of issues when the Shanghai communique was issued in 1972. But they did create a spirit of mutual understanding and consultation that proved to be extremely valuable in the succeeding decades. That's what we need to see. The problem is that I see domestic politics, and here I agree with you, in both countries, making it harder and harder for that kind of deal to be done. I am confident that President Xi uh, is the master of Chinese politics, and I'm confident that China's economic reforms will proceed. Everything I've heard since I've been in Beijing leads me to believe that realism about what needs to be done uh, is gradually s filtering down through the party, down to the local officials, through the state-owned enterprises. I don't see domestic trouble uh, coming in China. But in, in the United States, domestic trouble is guaranteed 
by the very nature of the presidential election system. And we should all be very worried that the next president of the United States might be a distinctly hostile president from the vantage point of China. That's why it's important to try and settle issues like the South China Sea before we get to November. And I hope that President Obama will do somewhat more than he's done so far uh, to achieve that before he leaves office. You know, Neil, I'm very glad that the historians and politicians in Britain think alike. Uh, that's why Prime Minister David Cameron put his money on AIIB. Uh, hopefully, that China will be yet another constructive and responsible major economy in the foreseeable future. Thank you for being with us on this dialogue. Thank you. With that, we come to the end of this discussion with Professor Neil Ferguson, a historian from Harvard University. I'll see you next time. Until then, goodbye. <laughs>